I hope you had a, a good uh, discussions in the breakout sessions. Um, I think in the end there were only three uh, rooms in use, uh, cat, uh, goat, and rhino, uh, from what I can see. Uh, I'm guessing that Tom, there was nobody in Quokka. So uh, well, let's just hear back from uh, room cat and we have uh, plenty of time to hear how the discussion went there. Uh, anyone from room, room cat? Is there anyone from Chromecat who wants to tell us uh, how the discussion went there? I went yesterday, so I'm passing on to someone else. Uh, okay, yeah, that's fine, Adam. Uh, any of the Chromecatters who want to report back? I do, if no one's going. Okay. So, <laughs> Peter? Yeah, you, please. No, no, I will, I will add, to, you start. Okay, so uh, the CAT group was discussing how do you measure how fair software is. is it, so the conclusion is that is uh, defining how to measure fair software is as challenging as how to measure fair data, especially when you go into the weeds. Uh, in different levels. What is important is you measure uh, binary things that actually impact a uh, majority of researchers, for example, in terms of findable. Is there's like a link uh, that we can use it to share that link with someone else? And it's, as I say, a binary thing where people can put on a checklist and maybe some software can verify that and do an assessment. And in terms of if this is something for founders should be doing, uh, we would like founders to have this kind of checklist or uh, advertise for fair software because this will create or start a cultural change that will benefit all researchers. Peter, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I found very interesting uh, what somebody said in our group. Um, that for measuring uh, the fairness of data, there is now a dozen or more tools um, available. And that um, when these tools are applied, the outcomes are, are quite variable. So it is uh, there you see that it's not so easy to measure these things um, uh, in an, uh, in an ob ob objective uh, way. And um, yeah, what was also said, what I liked a lot is that research software is not just one big thing. It is, there is a huge variety of different uh, categories or types of research software with very different purposes. And, um, and that it's also hard to, to put the same demands to, to all these different classes. And as, as an example, uh, uh, prototypes uh, came up. Uh, which are not um, created to begin with uh, to uh, to be sustained in the long run. Perhaps for prototypes, it is enough when they are just preserved um, and um, rather than maintained. Uh, yeah, those th those were two things that uh, that struck me in in our discussion. Great. Uh, is there any further comments from uh, Team Cat? Yeah, I, I never pointed was uh, given this. So to address this question that each software situation is quite different, um, one of the things that emerged that having checklists can be useful, uh, not as a way to measure exactly uh, how far project goes, but more as a way to start discussion just to give suggestions to each to each project. So when you're running a project and here are a bunch of items in which you should be thinking, um, maybe it's just impossible or just don't apply in your specific case, but maybe you should have a chat and, and think about it. And maybe it's actually relevant. And then have each project decide, okay, this is not, not relevant or this is relevant and we should make an effort and let's see how we can make an effort in this direction. 
Right, so really as a, as a progression path, it, it, it should be treated. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, any further comments from Team Cat? If not, I maybe will... a final a final oh. uh, thing, which 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 may be my just my private um, uh, idea, that I, I I find a certain danger in um, the more ambitious you you are with putting requirements on um, the fairness of software, the bigger the danger that it will not be obeyed. If we make it too complicated for researchers to to uh, uh, to comply with uh, with criteria set by funders or whoever, um, we should be aware of um, the possibility that it will not be uh, listened to. So it should remain <laughs> basic and, and practical. Yeah. Like like also was said in in uh, uh, Nicholas's uh, presentation when he tried to share the software of a of a friend and colleague. Yeah, uh, I, I absolutely agree, Peter. And it should be easy to use. Um, okay, so if we move now to Team Goat, I don't know if anybody would uh, like to share what was discussed in Team Goat room. I'm happy to start, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so we went on quite a journey. Um, so our topic question was, why is knowing about FAIR software important for researchers, research software engineers, data stewards, and others? And we started with the response, because we want reproducible science. Um, and this was immediately challenged um, that if you are trying to persuade researchers, um, they don't care about reproducible science, they care more about transparent and reusable science. Um, so then we started talking about, well, how do we ensure trust and transparency um, in research and software and um, why reproducibility doesn't really resonate with researchers. Um, and that comes down to, um, you know, they can't really publish reproductions, but it's important for there to be trust in published results so that they can be reused um, in other contexts. So um, we then started, you know, asking questions like, how do we come to achieve this trust? Um, not sure if we came to a conclusion on that. Um, but then we kind of asked the question, you know, why is um, FAIR software important to the different stakeholders? So why is it important to researchers versus why is it important to research software engineers versus why is it important to data stewards? Um, and then that kind of led on to questions on who's, responsi who's responsible for, for each of the, the aspects of, of fairness in software. Um, and then this sort of led us to a conversation around um you know is it actually important for these different stakeholders and we went uh down the journey of you know questioning if it is important at all and um the statement was made that 75 percent of fair is air and i'm not sure if i'll ever forget that um but um it kind of then led to a conversation around, you know, how the FAIR principles were intended to start, you know, its own journey. It was meant to be a conversation. It was meant to, you know, become collective norms and not an added burden on communities. Um, but it's become sort of more of something that is policed. Um, and so, yeah, so in general, we, we talked about how um, the interpretation of the principles have become a bit too abstract and how we need, and that um, researchers have become a bit fair fatigued. So we need to, you know, focus more on, you know, how open or fair can benefit researchers, um, have a conversation around how researchers can organize the work that they do um, using a shared vocabulary and improve um, and make more efficient their workflows and how they conduct research. Uh, research and the impact of that, as opposed to adding that additional burden, which is what Peter mentioned as well. Um, so I, oh, and then also I'm um, talking about kind of the unexpected or unintentional side effects or ramifications on careers, repositories and institutions that um, kind of enforcing or policing fairness uh, can have. And if anybody else wants to add anything that I missed. 
I think it was a great, a great summary. Rachel, thank you. Um, uh, we had a great team of note keepers. Um, so th this is indeed uh, kind of everything that we discussed in our uh, 45 minutes. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it resonated with what team Cat has been discussing that uh, uh, the, the, the principles should be a, a starting point for a conversation. And uh, we've heard about an example at uh, Delft University um, that they are actually doing this. They're not saying you have to be fair or you have to produce fair software, but uh, using these principles to, uh, yeah, to have a conversation about how can we improve research. And yeah, going back to the beginning, um, uh, how to improve the trust in our results. I think that's uh, what is uh, the end goal. It was a, a great discussion in, uh, in a, a crowded uh, breakout room. Nice. Uh, it sounds like it was a great journey indeed. Uh, and nice conversation. Anybody else from Team Goat wants to add some something on top? I thought it was a great conversation and basically we didn't we didn't fall for the rhetoric we actually questioned what were we trying to do and it actually I think it ties nicely to what Peter said that if you become too dogmatic um then you just shoot yourself in the foot which is what I think what what I summarize what Peter said yeah absolutely agree uh okay so if nobody wants to add anything else from team goat uh then team rhino i don't know andy or shay want to uh sure i, I can kind of sure. go through what we so in our kind of going through a bunch of our notes i think at the end of the day like we, we the take home message at the end was very much uh, i think kind of summed it up nicely like you know when you're starting a band or, or software or any sort of organization think about the end of your journey at the beginning of your journey and kind of i talked a, a little bit about that but at the end of the day like a lot of folks like they just want to pick start off like, let's just pick our license um but often like that kind of defines a lot of the culture like can i even fork my code do i have to fork my code to change my license and then that it really very quickly went into like, all right, how do we even educate people about licenses and a kind of like conflagration, I guess, or with like ethics and a license and some and like how that has evolved over uh, over the period, like the last 30 years and even the last five years with especially a lot of open source licenses kind of leaving the open source initiatives definition and and, and putting more ethical type clauses or maybe economic clauses in there to like to sustain themselves and so forth. Um, and so like kind of just separating out like what's technical, what's legal, what's ethical. Um, and we really got into like more of that, like, yeah, at some point, like a lot of us got into open software because of advocacy and we believe in openness and transparency. Um, and how do we engage with that? And we pointed out some, uh, so, uh, some resources such as the uh, Code for Science and Society's handbook on uh, open software. Uh, and they're more like fun days, but like very much like ended up having to deal with a lot of society problems. And and, and then Focus has a Discover Cookbook, which is very much how, even how like set, setting food at your event sends a, an ethical message sometimes. Um, if, if nothing else, like if I don't include gluten-free food, at least where I live, there's a message that like we're not accepting gluten-free people and so the the old adage of beer and pizza maybe not the best choice always if you want to have the most diverse inclusive event so starting with like just the band and all the problems that kind of come up over the end but then like how do we actually translate this into things at the beginning of our lifetime that we can take real action on and be uh, intentional about our uh our our communities that we build Uh, Shrey, if you want to add anything. 
I think it was, uh, it was a couple of good book recommendations, one by <laughs> that Andy Gay, one by Donald Knuth about things that computer scientists rarely talk about, which uh, I think has gone onto the reading list and talks about uh, ethics. And, uh, and the, the other one was uh, The Founder's Dilemma, which was talking about climbing things as if you were at the end uh, of something, as if you had success, as if you were you were where you wanted to be, um, to help you think clearly about some of the issues up front. So more people just want to kind of dive in. The whole thing around ethics was quite sticky in the sense that once you put an ethical layer over open source, then ethics can kind of be used for good. There's good ethics and bad ethics, you know. You put, for example, that you don't want military use on some of your code. That's um, you know that will open you up to certain people applauding you, certain people criticizing you. But clearly, there's other people who, you know, might put even racist clauses or uh, other kinds of clauses in. So it's a, it's an area which is uh, um, it's an area which is more well, which isn't as clear. Which is about society itself. So. Yeah, it was really eye-opening. 